Now, I'll say again, I'm going to go through this as quickly as I can, so it's going to be very important that you pay close attention. All right. Uh, communion, which is what I'm going to talk about here in just a, just a few minutes, but let me just make you aware that communion uh, was mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the first three Gospels. Communion is about remembering the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary to bring us salvation. That is what communion is about. Is everybody listening to me? I'm already preaching. All right. Communion is about remembering because that's what Jesus said. Do this in remembrance of me. So when we partake of communion, it's about remembering the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary to bring us salvation. All right? That's what communion is about. And it was written about in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but not John. All right. John, on the other hand, is the only one, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of the four Gospels, John is the only one that recorded foot washing. Now, I think it's providential that John tells the story of foot washing, and this is uh, to some degree conjecture on the pastor's part, because the Bible doesn't say this. But uh, John was called the disciple whom Jesus loved. He's often called the beloved apostle. John, the beloved, is the author of four books in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and of course, Revelation. And he was the only apostle who did not die a martyr's death. All right? <clears throat> now, he went through a lot, but he died from all we know. He died a natural death. And one of the reasons is, and this is an assumption, is because he never, never doubted the identity of Jesus Christ. You remember even just before Jesus went away into the heavens, the Bible says that he went to his apostle on the, apostles on the mountain, and when he approached them, he realized that some of them were doubting his identity. John could not have been one of those because he was the beloved apostle. He's the one that Jesus absolutely trusted. He trusted him so much, in fact, that the Bible says that when Jesus was hanging on the cross, his mother was there, John was there. doesn't say anything about his earthly brethren. And he looked down at John, the beloved, and he said to his mother, Behold thy son. And he said to John, Behold thy mother. He was the apostle whom Jesus loved. Why? Because he was totally devoted to the Lord and the Lord's gospel. Because you see, that's the way love is. Love is totally devoted. Real love, anybody listening to me, real love is totally devoted. So John recorded an act of Jesus that spoke very loudly to the vital importance of love and binding the body of Christ together in harmony. And that's what foot washing was about. All right? John chapter 13, verse 4. He rises from supper and laid aside his garments, that is speaking of Jesus, and took a towel and girded himself. <clears throat> this was the, of course, what we call the last supper. And yes, it was the Passover supper for Jesus and his apostles. Verse 5 says, After that, he poureth into water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. That is, after supper was finished. And to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Now, the reason that Peter was so disturbed about this was because servants washed feet. Not a, a Lord that Peter had seen walk on water. Okay, you need to listen to me now. Not a Lord that Peter had seen walk on water. Not his Lord that he had seen raise Lazarus from the dead 
after he'd been in the grave four days. Jesus, you don't wash feet. Peter was there when he collected the fishes and loaves into 12 baskets after feeding 5,000 men. A man like that, he doesn't wash feet. Others wash his feet. And so when Jesus came to Peter, Peter said, Lord, you want to wash my feet? And Peter, in our modern-day vernacular, Peter said, I don't think so. Let me get down on my knees and wash your feet. And Jesus very quickly said, whoa, wait a minute. He said, you don't understand what I'm doing right now. You don't get it. Some of you don't get what we're doing tonight. Even after we wash one another's feet, you still might not get it right then. But he told Peter, you're going to get it. Eventually, you'll understand. Because, you see, I didn't come here like most of the Jews expected their Savior, their Messiah to come. That's why they crucified him. I didn't come here in a golden chariot with six white horses and a flaming sword to destroy your Roman enemy. That's not how I came because that's not how I'm going to build my kingdom. I'm going to build my kingdom with people who are submitted to me. I'm going to build my kingdom on people who don't speak their language. They speak my language. I'm going to build my kingdom on people who don't have a name for themselves. They carry my name. I'm, well, hallelujah. I'm going to build my kingdom on people who are totally submitted, not only to me, but to one another in love. Mm. Peter said, you won't ever wash my feet. Jesus said, if I wash thee not, thou hast, listen to this, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. How important is foot washing? Jesus said concerning communion, he said, do this in remembrance of me. When it came to foot washing, he said, if you don't do it, you have no part with me. Does that give us any indication of how important it is for us to wash one another's feet? I don't get a response from most of you, but let me just tell you, that gives us an indication of how important it is, how vitally important it is for us to wash one another's feet. Foot washing <clears throat> was primarily about the necessity of maintaining the harmony of the body of Christ by submitting to one another in agape love. Some of you didn't get that. Let me say it another way. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love one to another, not four. I can love you long distance. I can't love you long distance and wash your feet. Well, I love you, Brother Donnell, but, you know, I don't like some of that stuff you do. So I don't care for your cologne. I don't like the way you part your hair. Your shoes are kind of funky looking. And, <clears throat> you know, what you said last week I didn't care for. And, oh, no. You, you, no, you can't love like this long distance. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? And so Jesus said, if you don't do it, you got no part with me. This is not long distance love. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, submitting yourselves to one another in the fear of God. It's hard not to feel humbly submitted to your brother or sister when you have their foot in your hand. You can't do that long distance. Anybody listening to me tonight? Well, you know, Pastor, I came for the communion, but I'm not staying for foot washing. Shame on you. We might have to cut this part out of the video before we post it online. But if you don't stay for foot washing, shame on you. Because in order to maintain the beautiful spirit of loving harmony in God's church, Jesus said, if you don't do it, you have no part with me. Amen. Jesus exampled 
his love and the necessity of humble submission and loving one another, agape loving one another, by washing the feet of his apostles. Now, listen carefully to this. This is vitally important. The entire body is connected by ligaments. Ligaments are like very strong rubber bands that hold the bones of the body together. And this is the thigh bone. They're connected beneath the, the uh, kneecap in a joint. And that joint, those two bones are held together at that joint by rubber bands called ligaments. Take that ligament out and your leg just flops around. You can't even walk. Every bone in the body is connected by ligaments if it's a joint bone. These ligaments allow the bones to move, and they safely limit the range of motion to prevent the body from becoming disjointed. You see, without ligaments in the body, the body would just be a big pile of bony blubber that is incapable of productive movement. You can't walk, you can't raise your arm, you can't feed yourself, you can't work a job, you can't support your family. You're just lying there. Someone has to take care of you. I don't even know how long you can survive without ligaments. Now, this is actually not only a physiological fact. This is a biblical fact. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. And above all these things, put on charity. That is agape love. How many understand agape love? Agape love is God love. That's the kind of love God has for us and that we can have for God when he fills us with his spirit. How many understand that? Agape love, okay. <clears throat> so Paul is telling the church at Colossae, and above all these things put on charity or agape love, which is the bond of perfectness. The word bond from the original Greek means Anybody still here? It means ligaments. You know what that means? That without the love of God in a church, it's nothing but a pile of bones and flesh and is useless even to itself. And Jesus is saying, if you don't participate in foot washing and the submission in agape love to one another, you have no part with me. You don't fit in the body. Pastor, that's harsh. It's Bible. It's Bible, which is the bond of perfectness, that is, completeness or maturity or wholeness. We're not even complete without that love of God holding us together. By participating in foot washing, Jesus was teaching his apostles that humble, loving submission to one another and his agape love is the key ingredient to holding the body of Christ together in harmony. Not unity. Harmony. You could be a mass of bones and flesh just lying on a bed, unable to function. And your body's all connected and it's all together. And it's in unity. But you don't have harmony until everything's functioning like it's supposed to. The body of Christ was never intended to be a body of unity. From the get-go, God designed it to be a body of harmony. Let's all say it together. Harmony. Let's all say it together. Harmony. And foot washing helps us to maintain that loving, harmonious relationship with our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. And not only that, but Jesus said, if you get that, if you understand that, you're going to be happy. You want to prove it to you? John chapter 13, verse 17. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. You are going to be a happier people after foot washing tonight. Let me say it again. You are going to be a happier people after foot washing tonight. Oh, some of you may have trouble believing that. But if you are washing your brother or sister's feet in love, the sisters, the sisters, the brothers, the brothers, by the way. We don't want any murders here tonight. 
But if you wash your brother or sister's feet tonight in agape love, after it's all said and done, and we hear all the fireworks going on outside, and the clock strikes midnight, you are going to be happier than you are right now. Why? Because Jesus said you would. Happy are you if you know these things, if you do them. And we're going to do them. Somebody say amen. Now let me talk to you for a little bit. When did I take the floor? What time was it? 10.40. Okay, I didn't. Okay, I'll take your word for it. I want to talk to you for a little bit about communion. Is everybody doing all right? Did you get that brief little sermon lesson lecture? Have we got it? You plan on having, having your feet washed tonight and washing somebody else's feet? Say amen. amen. If you're not, th- no, 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 don't say anything. Just be quiet. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, I want to talk to you about communion here for a little bit. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. The word left from the original Greek means to, it means to leave. As if uh, you just came in and you got other things on your mind and you got busy doing this, that, or the other thing, and then you're ready to go and you're Now, where did I put those keys? Anybody ever done that? Uh, let's have a show of hands. Anybody ever? Oh, look at, look at that. Well, I know right exactly where I left mine. My wife will tell you, I put them in the exact same place every time. It's pretty rare for me to lose my keys. I'm a creature of habit, a little OCD involved, I think. <clears throat> That's what the word means here in the book of Revelation. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left. Thy first love. It's a lot like just coming in the house kind of qu- quick and you got other things to do, maybe groceries to put in their kitchen and you just threw them down somewhere and you can't remember where you put them. <clears throat> she was a few minutes late getting home from the office so everyone had to wait an extra hour for supper to be ready. Well, it happened again later in the week. Over the course of the next few months, it became a habit. Initially, nothing was said. Her husband knew she stayed busy with work, the house, manifold responsibilities, and she always had a full plate. Then he noticed that her affection for him began to wane. She was too hurried for a morning kiss, too rushed for the lingering embraces they so anxiously anticipated in the early days of their marriage. Now a quick smile and a perfunctory wave of the hand is about all he could hope for as she headed out the door. What was once an intense love affair between a passionate, caring wife and her doting husband had become nothing more than a routine of obligations and responsibilities. Cook the supper, clean the house, bring home a paycheck to help with the bills. That had become her life. She was so caught up in the regimen of life that the joy of life with her beloved had begun to slip out of her grasp. Oh, it's not that she didn't love her husband anymore. There were just so many other things that wanted her attention that his love just didn't seem to be a priority anymore. Well, the church at Ephesus sang about the Lord being an on-time God. But as time passed, they were not on-time saints. They praised him for never leaving nor forsaking them. But many times they left him standing at the door of the church waiting for them to show up. They gave him glory for being a faithful God. 
But they were faithful to so many other things. They just couldn't fit him into their busy schedule. They set aside a day to celebrate his birthday, but they often had places to go, people to see, things to do. So that during the birthday party of Jesus, his own family couldn't find the time to attend his celebration. They wanted God to heal them. When their children were suffering, they wanted God to respond to their prayers. When their loved ones were hurting, they wanted God to show up and heal. They wanted God to respond in an instant when they were in distress. They expected God to be loyal to them even when their loyalties were often diluted and spread to other things that they loved more. These observations could easily have been a valid assessment of almost every congregation since the first church was formed in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. But it's also a vivid portrait of the church at Ephesus. They left their first love, not their first in chronological order, because they might have had two or three or four, ten different loves, as many in this congregation had possibly before you were married. But it wasn't the first in chronological order. It was the foremost love. It was the one that was most important. It was the one that held the most value. And the Bible said, you left that love. Like a set of car keys, you came running in the house and threw it down somewhere and got busy and too busy and too involved to remember where you mislaid the keys. They were too busy with life to remember the giver of life. Other things occupied their interests, their attention, their affection, their love. In the beginning, they were loyal, faithful, attentive. But in time, they were preoccupied, disinterested, and focused on everything but their relationship with him. Oh, it's not that they deliberately walked away from God. It's not that they fell out of love. It's just that along the way they started picking up everything else that looked pretty. Everything that caught their eye. Everything that seemed engaging. So eventually emphasis Ephesus mislaid God. It wasn't intentional. It wasn't on purpose. It was just running the house and throwing it down and getting preoccupied with other things and then forgetting where she left her love. There's a very disturbing but informative verse of Scripture found in the book of Psalms that serves as a, an early warning to Ephesus and all of God's people who become too busy to nurture their relationship with him. Psalm 9, verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell in all the nations that forget God. The word forget from the original Hebrew means to mislay. It is basically the same as the Greek word left. In the book of Revelation, she left her first love. She mislaid her first love. Ephesus was warned about that in Psalm. You got to be careful not to mislay your first love. Ephesus didn't intentionally make a con conscious effort to mislay God. It was a gradual process of a cooling relationship that lost its intensity due to a lack of affection by Ephesus. The diverse offerings of a world that was constantly vying for her attention. That's what caused her to mislay God. But we must understand that the results of mislaying God are the same. Whether it's Ephesus or the Church of Columbus, the results of mislaying God are the same. When you mislay your car keys, you're stranded. You're unable to get to your destination until you find them. But when you mislay God, you're stuck where you are with no escape. You'll never get to your heavenly destination. Never rest safely in the arms of the Savior until you rekindle that relationship and reconnect with your first love. 
One of the things we've got to do during communion here in just a few moments when we remember the Christ of the cross and his supreme sacrifice for each of us is to reconnect with our first love and recommit to our relationship with him. See, that's why Jesus gives us this commandment, the divine imperative, the sacred obligation, the sacrament of communion, if you will, in Luke chapter 22. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. Don't forget. Don't forget. Don't mislay me. A number of years ago, my dad died <coughs> after the funeral and then the graveside had been completed. My aunts <coughs> that were still living at that time, one of them came over to me. One of my favorite aunts, we used to go to her house <coughs> for homecomings and Christmas and some of the guys would get together, go out in the woods and squirrel hunt and there'd be, oh Lord, I don't know, 30 guys out there sometime. Shotguns, 22 rifles, hunting squirrel. That'd be a lot if you were hunting bear. But we were hunting little old tiny rat-like squirrels. Anyway, we didn't do it because we wanted squirrel. We just did it because it's a guy thing, you know. <clears throat> it's kind of a coming-of-age deal for, for me because when I was 12, my daddy let me use his uh, very special that my brother has now, rifle. <laughs> and uh, my uncle would pull the vines, and the vine would shake the nest way up in the tree, and the squirrels would come running out, and there'd be like 30 guns going on. <laughs> Little guy didn't have a chance. But that aunt was kind of special because she's the one who hosted those homecoming events, and they would be. Oh, Lord, 60, 70, 80 people in her little three-bedroom house, and we'd be all over the place. And, and uh, she was just a special aunt. She, she had some, uh, she cooked some great food that I always enjoyed, and uh, <clears throat> she was just a, just a very special lady. And she came to me after the graveside was completed at my dad's funeral. She looked at me with tears in her eyes. And she said, please, don't forget me. Her husband is now dead. Most of her brothers and sisters, I guess all of her brothers are dead. I think she might have one or two sisters left. She is in her late 80s, early 90s. And so her immediate family is brothers and sisters, mom and dad, they're all gone. And with a pleading look in her eye, she said, please don't forget me. Don't confine me to a home somewhere and put me out of mind and let me just eventually die while I'm no trouble to you or anyone else. Don't hide me somewhere back yonder in the recesses of your memory so that I'm never th a thought. Regardless of all the joyous times that you had at my house when you were a child, please don't. Please don't throw me down like a set of car keys. And you're in a hurry with life to remember where they are. Please don't mislead me. Please. Please. Please don't forget me. <clears throat> During the course of this coming year, we must hold ourselves and one another accountable for our relationship with God. We must decide tonight specific times that we're going to pray. If you don't already have a specific prayer time, you decide that tonight as you renew your relationship with Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if you never fast 
you need to decide tonight, I am going to fast. And then whatever day that falls on, you need to be faithful to it. What, what are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about not mislaying something so valuable as the love of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you need to make up your mind. I'm going to be in God's house. I'm going to be faithful in my stewardship. I'm going to be faithful in my relationship to my brothers and sisters. I will not mislay my Lord. I will not mislay my first love. I will not leave the house without showing him affection. I will not lie down at night without him being my final thought. He is, <laughs> he is going to remain at the forefront of my mind's thought 24-7. That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Lord, I want, to, I want to have perfect peace in 2022. I don't want to be worried about a virus. I don't want to be worried about losing my job. I don't want to be worried about my family getting sick. I don't want to be worried about my, my losing my home or my car breaking down. I don't want to worry about anything. I want to have perfect peace because I want my mind to be stayed on him. I refuse I refuse to mislay him. Life is too short. Eternity is too long to mess this up. If you don't get it right now, you won't get a do-over when you stand before the white throne judgment. Use this time that we have come together to remember the Lord's sacrifice on Calvary to pay our sin debt. Use this time to renew your relationship with Jesus Christ. Repent of past failures, and recommit to a future of faithfulness and service to him. Ah, oh, there's so much you could be doing for the Lord. There's so many areas of his work that you could be involved in. You've always heard that idle hands are the devil's workshop, and an idle mind is his playground. Don't continue to allow your life to be dominated by Satan manipulating your carnal preferences. Yield yourself during this time of Holy Communion and become in 2022 what God has designed for your life. If you've sinned, then repent. Fig leaves can only conceal the raw reality of sin, but it takes the bloody death of a loving Savior to wash that sin away and cover its destruction in a warm blanket of forgiveness and mercy. And Jesus Christ wants to forgive. Second Peter chapter 3, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Let's lift our hands just for a moment and love him, shall we? Yeah.